Pomegranate Seed by Edith Wharton Charlotte Ashby paused on her doorstep. Dark had descended on the brilliancy of the March afternoon and the grinding, rasping street life of the city was at its highest. She turned her back on it, standing for a moment in the old-fashioned marble-flagged vestibule before she inserted her key in the lock. The sash curtains drawn across the inner door softened the light within to a warm blur through which no details showed. It was the hour when, in the first months of her marriage to Kenneth Ashby, she had most liked to return to that quiet house in a street long since deserted by business and fashion. In the very heart of the hurricane, she had found her tiny islet. And now, in the last months, everything was changed, and she always wavered on the doorstep and had to force herself to enter. Her own drawing room, in which, since the death of Kenneth's first wife, neither furniture nor hangings had been changed, because there had never been enough money, but which Charlotte had made her own by moving furniture about and adding more books, another lamp, a table for the new reviews, on the occasion of her only visit to the first Mrs. Ashby, a distant, self-centred woman whom she had known very slightly, she had looked about her with an innocent envy, feeling it to be exactly the drawing room she would have liked for herself, and now for more than a year it had been hers to deal with as she chose, where she sat reading by the fire or answering notes at the pleasant roomy desk, or going over her stepchildren's copybooks, till she heard her husband's steps. Now she thought of one thing only. The letter she might or might not find on the hall table. The letter was always the same, a square greyish envelope with Kenneth Ashby Esquire, written on it in bold but faint characters. From the first, it had struck Charlotte as peculiar that anyone who wrote such a firm hand should trace the letters so lightly, as though there were not enough ink in the pen, or the writer's wrist were too weak to bear upon it. Another curious thing was that, in spite of its masculine curves, the writing was so visibly feminine. The letter was presumably delivered by hand, but by whose? The first had come the day after their return from their honeymoon, from which they had returned to New York after an absence of more than two months. Re-entering the house with her husband, she had seen, alone, on the hall table, the grey envelope. Her first thought was, why, I've seen that writing before. But where, she could not recall. On that first day, she would have thought no more of the letter if, when her husband's glance lit on it, she had not chanced to be looking at him. It all happened in a flash, his seeing the letter, putting out his hand for it, raising it to his short-sighted eyes to decipher the faint writing, and then abruptly withdrawing the arm he had slipped through Charlotte's and moving away to the hanging light his back turned to her. She had waited, waited for a sound, an exclamation, waited for him to open the letter, but he had slipped it into his pocket without a word and followed her into the library. And there they had sat down by the fire and lit their cigarettes. And he had remained silent, 
his head thrown back broodingly against the armchair, his eyes fixed on the hearth, and presently had passed his hand over his forehead and said, Wasn't it unusually hot at my mother's tonight? I've got a splitting head. Mind if I take myself off to bed? Since then, Charlotte had never been present when he had received the letter. Evidently, whatever the letter contained, he wanted to be by himself to deal with it, and when he reappeared, he looked years older, emptied of life and courage, and hardly conscious of her presence. Sometimes he was silent for the rest of the evening, and if he spoke, it was usually to hint some criticism of her household arrangements. At such times, Charlotte would remember the friendly warnings she had received when she became engaged to Kenneth Ashby. Marrying a heartbroken widower, isn't that rather risky? You know Elsie Ashby absolutely dominated him. She had jokingly replied, he may be glad of a little liberty for a change. And in this respect, she had been right. When they came back from their honeymoon, the same friend said, What have you done to Kenneth? He looks twenty years younger. But what she noticed, after the grey letters began to come, was not so much his nervous, tentative fault-finding, which always seemed to be uttered against his will, as the look in his eyes when he joined her after receiving one of the letters. The look was not unloving, not even indifferent. It was the look of a man who had been so far away from ordinary events that when he returns to familiar things, they seem strange. There was another possibility, what was euphemistically called an old entanglement. Charlotte Ashby was a sophisticated woman. She had few illusions about the intricacies of the human heart. She knew that there were often old entanglements. But when she had married Kenneth Ashby, her friends, instead of hinting at such a possibility, had said, You've got your work cut out for you. Marrying a Don Juan is a sinecure to it. Kenneth's never looked at another woman since he first saw Elsie Corder. During all the years of their marriage, he was more like an unhappy lover than a comfortably contented husband. He'll never let you move an armchair or change the place of a lamp, and whatever you venture to do, he'll mentally compare with what Elsie would have done in your place. Except for an occasional nervous mistrust as to her ability to manage the children, a mistrust gradually dispelled by her good humour and the children's obvious fondness for her. None of these forebodings had come true. The desolate widower, of whom his nearest friends said that only his absorbing professional interests had kept him from suicide after his first wife's death, had fallen in love two years later with Charlotte Gorse, and after an impetuous wooing, had married her. And ever since, he had been as tender and lover-like as during those first radiant weeks. Before asking her to marry him, he had spoken to her frankly of his great love for his first wife and his despair after her sudden death. But even then, he had assumed no stricken attitude or implied that life offered no possibility of renewal. He had told Charlotte that he was sorry he couldn't afford to do the place over for her, but had begged her to make any changes she saw fit without bothering to consult him. His way of beginning their new life in the old setting was so frank and unembarrassed that it put her immediately at her ease. She was almost sorry to find that the portrait of Elsie Ashby, which used to hang over the desk in his library, had been transferred in their absence to the children's nursery. Knowing herself to be the indirect cause of this banishment, she spoke of it to her husband, 
but he answered, Oh, I thought they ought to grow up with her looking down on them. As time went by, she had to confess that she felt more at home in her new house, more at ease and in confidence with her husband, since that long, coldly beautiful face on the library wall no longer followed her with guarded eyes. With all this stored-up happiness to sustain her, it was curious that she had lately found herself yielding to a nervous apprehension. On this particular afternoon, she found herself unable to react against the feeling. She looked back down the silent street to the whirl and illumination of the great thoroughfare beyond. Outside there, she thought, skyscrapers, advertisements, telephones, wireless, airplanes, movies, motors, and all the rest of the 20th century. And on the other side of the door, something I can't explain. Something as old as the world, as mysterious as life. Nonsense! What am I worrying about? There hasn't been a letter for three months now. Well, she'd had enough of it. That was certain. She couldn't go on like that. If her husband turned white and had a headache on the days when the letter came, he seemed to recover afterward. But she couldn't. Her husband knew from whom the letter came and what was in it. He was prepared beforehand for whatever he had to deal with, and master of the situation, however bad, whereas she was shut out in the dark with her conjectures. She turned the key and went in. And there, on the table, lay the letter. She was almost glad of the sight. It seemed to justify everything, to put a seal of definiteness on the whole blurred business. She would have time to take the letter up to the drawing room, hold it over the tea kettle, solve the mystery and replace the letter where she had found it. She weighed the letter between thumb and finger, looked at it again under the light, started up the stairs with the envelope and came down again and laid it on the table. No, I evidently can't, she said, disappointed. Suddenly she decided. She would wait in the library and see for herself, see what happened between him and the letter when they thought themselves unobserved. At length, she heard Kenneth's latchkey and jumped up. The impulse to rush out and meet him had nearly made her forget why she was there, but she remembered in time and sat down again. She saw him throw his gloves on the hall table, and at that moment he saw the envelope. The light was full on his face, and what Charlotte first noted there was a look of surprise. He did not open it immediately, but stood motionless, the colour slowly ebbing from his face. When he opened it, he raised the letter still closer to his eyes, as though he had not fully deciphered it. Finally, he lowered his head, and she saw his lips touch the sheet. Kenneth! She exclaimed, and went on out into the hall. The letter clutched in his hand. Her husband turned and looked at her. Where were you? He said in a low, bewildered voice, like a man waked out of his sleep. In the library, waiting for you. What's the matter? What's in that letter? You look ghastly. Ghastly? I'm sorry. I've had a hard day at the office. One or two complicated cases. I look dog-tired, I suppose. Kenneth, she said, her heart beating excitedly. I waited here on purpose to see you come in. I wanted to watch you while you opened that letter. His face, which had paled, 
turned to dark red, then paled again. That letter? Why especially that letter? Because I've noticed that whenever one of those letters comes, it seems to have such a strange effect on you. A line of anger she had never seen before came out between his eyes and she said to herself, The upper part of his face is too narrow. That is the first time I ever noticed it. Ah, so you're in the habit of watching people open their letters when they don't know you're there. Not in the habit. I never did such a thing before. But I had to find out what she writes to you at regular intervals in those grey envelopes. He weighed this for a moment, then... The intervals have not been regular, he said. Oh, I dare say you've kept a better account of the dates than I have, she retorted, her magnanimity vanishing at his tone. All I know is that every time that woman writes to you, why do you assume it's a woman? It's a woman's writing. Do you deny it? He smiled. No, I don't deny it. I asked only because the writing is generally supposed to look more like a man's. And this woman, what does she write to you about? About business, legal business. In a way, yes. Business in general. You look after her affairs for her? Yes. You've looked after them for a long time? Yes. A very long time. Kenneth, dearest, won't you tell me who she is? No. I can't. He paused and brought out, as if with a certain hesitation, Professional secrecy. The blood rushed from Charlotte's heart to her temples. Don't say that. Don't. Why not? Because I saw you kiss the letter. The, the writing is very faint. You must have seen me holding the letter close to my eyes to try to decipher it. No... I saw you kissing it! He was silent. Didn't I see you kissing it? He sank back into indifference. Perhaps. Men don't kiss business letters, even from women who are very old friends, unless they have been their lovers and still regret them. He shrugged his shoulders slightly and turned away as if he considered the discussion at an end and were faintly disgusted at the turn it had taken. You've only got to show me the letter. I can't. Then the woman who wrote it is your mistress. No, dear, no. I swear to you she never was my mistress.